Hello, good morning. Welcome to Japan, the next generation of growth, a one-hour programme brought to you by CityWire and Fidelity International. My name is Gavin Lumsden, I'm from CityWire, and together with my colleague Jeremy Gordon, we'll be presenting today's show to you. In a minute, we'll be joined from Tokyo by our guest speaker, Nicholas Price, Fund Manager of Fidelity Japan Trust. Nicholas took on the investment trust six years ago. Since then, he has used his three decades experience of investing in Japanese companies to put the closed-end fund at the top of its sector over five years. Nicholas is going to talk about how he runs the portfolio and where he finds the new breed of entrepreneurial companies he's most excited about. It's a particularly good time to hear from Nicholas because after a few months of renewed coronavirus concerns, Japan's stock market has been boosted in the past week by the decision of the country's unpopular Prime Minister, Yoshihide Suga, to stand down. After the presentation, I'm going to ask Nicholas a few questions, and then it's over to you for Q&A. If you have a question for Nicholas about the trust or investing in Japan, you can submit it at any time via the chat box to the right of this screen. Jeremy will monitor your questions and help me put them to Nicholas in the last section of our show. Also, if you'd like to take part in our polling today, look out for the Vote Here link in the microsite. I'll be asking you a couple of questions in a moment. At the end, we'd be grateful if you could complete our short feedback form, which can also be found in the microsite you're viewing us through now. Right, let's meet our fund manager. Good evening, Nicholas. Thanks for joining us at the end of your day. Um, I can see you're all ready to go. But before you start, let's ask our viewers a couple of questions. So the first one is, do you currently invest in a Japan-specific fund? Uh, we've got two choices, yes or no. So while we wait for those, Nicholas, um, let's just uh, begin our conversation. Um, is, is investing in Japan a bit like investing in the UK in as much as we often hear the FTSE 100, three quarters of its revenues you know, exposed to, uh, to the global economy? Uh, is Japan, uh, Japan's a bit like that as well. Fairly, fairly similar, yes. Um, around about 55% or so of earnings come, come from overseas, so it's a pretty similar um, uh, ratio. A little bit perhaps higher in the UK compared with Japan, as we have a bigger domestic economy. Okay, brilliant. Now let's see if we've got any words up. Okay, look, well, that's a, good, uh, that's a good start. So over 90% of our audience are already invested in a Japan fund, so uh, that makes sense. Well, <laughs> and uh, let's ask for another question then. Follow-up is... Are you likely to increase your allocation uh, to Japan this year? Are you thinking of increasing the amount you invest in Japan? Um, again, yes or no, please. And yeah, Nicholas, um, you know, I've referred to the political events. Um, the FT this week reported or commented that um, the animal spirits seem to be returning to Japan's stock market. What, what, what do you do? You agree? Well, I think it's partly a consequence of the, uh, the, the the prime minister resigning and a potentially perhaps more popular candidate emerging, and that's leading, I think, to uh, you know, as you said, a little bit more animal spirits um, returning to the market, um, and also perhaps as we were starting to potentially sort of exit a little bit of the the uh, from the from the COVID um, issues as well. So. That's, we started to see a slight improvement there as well, and that's probably helping sentiment. Absolutely. Okay. Now, as what's the results here? Okay. Look. 67% of our viewers are thinking of uh, increasing the amount they invest in Japan. So that's uh, a great audience for you to speak to today, Nicholas. Um, why don't you start your presentation? O over to you now, please. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving me the time today. I, I will uh, just start my presentation just by firstly giving you a, a quick uh, introduction to myself and my background and the Fidelity team in Tokyo, and then go through the trust strategy and the opportunity that I see um, in Japan. Um, so if you just turn to the, uh, the, first, the first page of the slide. Thank you. Um, this just gives a kind of brief background to myself. So as you can tell, I'm originally from the UK, um, but I've been uh, based here in Tokyo uh, for about 30 years. Um, I finished the UK university and then uh, went to Keio University in Tokyo and studied Japanese language uh, before joining uh, Fidelity as a research analyst in Tokyo back in 1993. Um, I covered a whole bunch of sectors as we do in the bottom-up style of Fidelity. And then since 1999, I've been a, a portfolio, portfolio manager in Tokyo, um, very much with a growth um, style. And uh, I took over the, uh, the trust uh, management of the trust in 2015. So it's coming on now for a six years anniversary. Um, so I think the kind of, one of the key differentiating points of Fidelity is, is we're obviously a very global organization, 
but we also have a lot of on the ground research in Japan as well. So like myself, I visit companies, I speak Japanese to, uh, in the meetings, and we have a team of about 12 analysts in Tokyo who are just dedicated to finding great ideas in the Japanese equity market on the ground here. I think that's kind of a really great uh, differentiating point for us um, as, as, as an organization. So just sort of turning to uh, my, my sort of career at, uh, at, uh, in, at Fidelity on the next page, uh, the next slide, if you turn to the next slide. Um, this just shows this just shows the topics, which is the uh, Japanese stock market index um, in actually in UK pounds. And you can see we've had a sort of up and down period for quite a while so since I, when I joined. Fairly sort of a bit of a bear market for quite a while, but then uh, probably since about 2011, 2012, we started to see a much better equity market um, with a number of different factors driving that earnings and also corporate governance improvements, etc. And I was appointed, as you can see here on the, on the far right of the chart there, to the Elder Japan Trust um, back in uh, 2016. And since then, we've obviously done, the market's done quite well. Um, and we've also been investing in pre-IPOs as well, which also contributed to the funds, uh, the trust's uh, sort of long-term performance. So that's just a sort of a long 10, you know, uh, 2020 20 year plus um, uh, example of the, of, the, of the market. But I think it's, it's worthwhile shining a light on the Japanese market itself. Because uh, often with investors, you often hear, I'm not going to invest in Japan because there's an aging population, whereas perhaps other countries have you know, rising populations. But I think that's kind of a, that's an opposite excuse to avoid investing. But the, the actual performance of the market itself has been very good over the longer term. Now, I just sort of perhaps point to some of the factors that have been driving that. So if you turn to the next slide. That's great, thank you. Um, this just shows the topics, which is the blue line um, in, in, in UK pounds, and then this shows the, the FTSE, also obviously in, in pounds, its performance over the last 10 years. And you can see that um, there's been an opportunity cost if you hadn't invested in Japan, at least relative to the FTSE, um, as a 60% difference in that performance in UK pounds over that 10 year period. So why, why, why is that happening? Um, uh, if you perhaps turn to the next page. <laughs> Partially, Japan is, uh, has a lot of companies like Sony um, or uh, exporters who are global and growing outside Japan. So while perhaps the domestic market may be fairly flat um, in terms of, sort of overall GDP, the companies are able to take opportunities growing in China and Asia, which is on their doorstep. And so that's contributed, I think, to some performance. And additionally, also, the change in corporate governance over the period of time has also, I think, helped companies to, before they were to perhaps 10, 15 years ago, were not so shareholder orientated. We've certainly seen a move more towards companies being more rational, um, uh, you know, things with their balance sheets and with their cash flows than in the past. And I think that's helped to also drive up um, the performance. But probably the most of all, it's just been the earnings of, a, of the market bottom, Companies restructured after their after the you know the deflationary period, and, and and companies came out of that and have had very good earnings, which has really driven the market um, up over over the last ten years or so. So it's been a very positive earnings cycle for Japanese companies on the doorstep to China and Asia as well. If you turn to the, to the next slide, this is a kind of interesting chart. Um, and it just shows, I think, that probably that some of the changes in corporate governance and shareholder returns, which you can see on the right-hand chart, which show the dividend payouts and also buybacks. And so you can see that Japan's moved up very, quick, very quickly, um, especially over the last five or six years with corporate governance change for paying out more in dividends and more buybacks. Um, and to the extent to where that, where that hasn't yet been completed, you can see on the page on the left-hand chart here, um, the blue the blue line shows the net cash positions uh, of the of the companies, and you can see that the, um, the topics um, almost perhaps 60% of companies are net cash, whereas, for example, in the UK and in the United States, that's below 20%, and that means that over time, as companies start to use that that cash more on the balance sheet that can be used more for shareholder returns. And that's really part of the ongoing story in Japan, why I think the stock market has been doing better 
over the last five, five to 10 years than the previous 20. Turning now to more sort of on the, on the sort of more micro level um, and, and, and the trust style, I very much focus on under-researched, um, often mid and small cap stocks, which are a key source of returns in the market. So why do I do that? Um, if you look on page 11, um, you can see the, uh, the performance of the Topics 100, which is obviously the, the, big, the biggest companies in Japan, and then also the performance of the small and mid. And you can see, again, there's a quite a large divergence, which opens up over time between um, those, those numbers. So you can see almost a perhaps a 30% difference there over that long period of time. And so in Japan, smaller companies offer a richer source of excess returns. And so the trust tends to invest in, in those smaller companies where there's long runways of growth. And you can see these multiple compounders um, and also where they're perhaps less well covered and less, less well known than some of the established names. So that's also been a key contributor to the trust's sort of longer term of performance. Turning to page 12, um, this, is, this can be shown sort of the sort of, I think in particular, Japan is a very unique market compared with the UK and continental Europe and even the United States in that there's very limited analyst coverage, um, which creates a wealth of sort of under-researched names. Um, so being on the ground here, turning over the stones, trying to find you know, the future pearls as it were, um, is quite lucrative in the sense that almost half the companies in the mid-cap area have very little coverage or no coverage at all. So that means there's an opportunity for us to go out and learn about these companies and understand those companies um, better than most of the people in the market. And that allows us, I think, to generate um, over the midterm to reasonable um, alpha generation. To put it into context, you can see on the right-hand chart here, this shows the number of companies with under five sell-side analyst recommendations. And you can see actually Japan actually dwarfs the UK and, the, and continental Europe in having the, the, perhaps the, 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 most the most number of companies that are not well covered. And so that, again, is not, that's, a, that's, I think, an opportunity for us to be on the ground there and to you know, find some of those names which we think can be multi-baggers over time for the trust. Um, turning to the, to the next page, um, this is one example of uh, one of the companies we found in Japan, which is called Just Systems. It's not a household name at all, um, but it's an example of a company which is pretty much has no, has no street coverage. Um, and the business was transforming as they moved to more of a recurring business model. Uh, they have a B2C business for um, uh, basically education tablets. Um, for teaching, uh, you know, primary, primary and secondary school children um, using a sort of AI, and this business um, has grown quite rapidly. Um, and you can see the, the result was we invested, I think, back in 2017 when the market cap was about 600 million US, sorry, pounds, and the, the stock uh, moved up about uh, well, around about uh, three or well, four or five times uh, to the to the peak of that. And again, this is an example of a company where very little, very little coverage. But um, by being able to identify new new trends, we're able to generate quite significant alpha um, for um, and, and absolute returns for the trust shareholders. Have you turned to the next the slide? The other area I, I would also mention, which also I think is really uniquely interesting um, and, and sort of an opportunity for the trust, is sort of pre-IPO opportunities in Japan. And that, that's, that they, 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 the, the, the opportunities for the trust in the pre-IPO market have been increasing and represent, I think, an additional source of differentiated returns for some of our um, peer, peer group and also in, in, the, in the Japanese um, uh, investment trust world. So to put it on to sort of simply, we're seeing a lot more entrepreneurial activity in Japan uh, compared with probably 10 years ago. And a lot of new growth companies are coming through, which is creating opportunities for us. Um, so I guess what's changed is that perhaps 10 years ago, 15 years ago, a graduate from a top university would graduate, go into a blue chip company, stay there, and then when they were 60 years old, um, retire. And that was, their, that was their kind of their career cycle. And we've seen over time, definitely we've seen much more emergence of sort of younger generation of people who are not looking for a job for life. And perhaps they might join the blue chip company at the beginning, but they will perhaps quit after three or four years 
and do do another job or set up a new business, perhaps dealing with the problems that they that they saw when they were working in that previous company, and then make a new business. And so, Fidelity in Japan, we we have a very good network of of of, of entrepreneurs in terms of sort of the, the sort of network, as it were. And so, we're able to where we, where we can to um, help some of these entrepreneurs in the latest later stage of their uh, sort of pre-IPO journeys and invest in those uh, stocks. And you know, again, being on the ground here helps in terms of that, those contacts. And additionally, also for our analysts as well, we're able to see some of the new emerging companies, and perhaps that will g gives us additional insight into the listed companies as well in terms of their future, you know, competitive, you know, their future competitors emerging. And so I, we find it really works um, quite well, and we've achieved sort of I think quite quite good initial returns uh, for the trust uh, from this uh, strategy. Um, just to introduce a couple of names um, on the next slide. Um, this is just some of the pre-IPO investments that the trust has invested in and then have, and then, and have listed. Um, so our first one we did in 2016, uh, which is Raxel, um, and we invest, that was about uh, about two years or so, around about two years before the IPO, and we achieved around annualized rates of return of about 80%. Um, and then Coconola, which is a, a C2C um, skills uh, trading site, that uh, was a more, even perhaps stronger returns and achieved about 150% annualized returns uh, from the, from the you know, initial investment to the IPO. And those stocks we continue to also own in the portfolio, um, as we think they're still you know, long-term you know, multi-year compounders uh, that we kind of know quite well. The next slide sort of goes on under the bonnet of Fidelity Japan Trust. Perhaps just a few sort of points I think that differentiate the trust um, a little bit from um, its peers. Um, on the, on the, the first point is obviously the, 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 the trust, is, as, as the presenter uh, previously mentioned, has been a top performer over key time periods, uh, though it does trade at a large discount via some of its peers, uh, despite that better performance, which I hope that over time investors will notice and the discount will um, uh, be reduced over, over that uh, uh, mid midterm. Again, being on the ground here, speaking the language, seeing hundreds of companies a year, both new and established, I think adds a lot of value um, for people who are just you know, perhaps not on the ground um, uh, in Japan, not seeing the changes that are occurring um, you know, as it were live here. Um, thirdly, again, being, in, being on the ground here and having a good network uh, with companies that we, we know very well, we're able to get, you know, it's also good access to unlisted securities, which I believe also adds differentiated returns for the trust. And I think will be a source of longer term alpha generation. And then again, then again, also, I'm very much focused on midterm returns for the shareholders of the trust. So I, I, I take very much a market cap agnostic approach. So I don't necessarily invest in just small cap or just large cap. I'm, I look really where the opportunities are um, for the, uh, the trust. And then obviously on the right hand side, they're just showing the basic summary of the trust. So obviously it has uh, independent board of directors, the gearing um, I use flexibly depending on the opportunity in the market. Um, it's uh, currently just under 25%. Um, I took that up last year when I saw there was an opportunity with the large market sell off. Um, but again, I'm flexible. It will depend on the um, valuation um, of the, of the um, stocks that I'm using gearing for and um, may, that may go down over time as they start approaching target prices. And then again, as we mentioned, uh, the fund, the trust has the ability to do unlisted securities uh, currently with board approval up to 10% of the fund. And again, also, as I mentioned, despite that the, we are, unfortunately we have the fund, the trust has a discount uh, to 10 AV, but the board also has a, an active buyback policy in place. Just sort of turning to sort of give you a little bit of flavor of some of the names that are in the fund, and they're in the fund. I, I just uh, perhaps highlight a few buckets um, of, of, uh, of, of, of names that I, that I, that I like and that I like. Um, so these are kind of often there's sort of long-term compounding uh, growth names, um, often efficiency enablers um, that can help companies with their problems. Um, so for example, in machinery, uh, in factory automation, uh, Misumi and Kiens, uh, I would highlight Misumi's Kiens I help really help companies um, improve their manufacturing efficiency. Um, the second area, as I just mentioned, some of the online service areas. So top positions in the portfolio 
um, would be sort of Recruit and also Coconola. So Recruit is um, a, um, a very diversified sort of internet um, company, but their one of their chief kind of growth prospects areas is, is, is their, they own actually Indeed, which you probably come across in the UK as it's one of the sort of top job listing sites, and they're actually the owner of it. So they, 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 they've done extremely well um, with, the, with that M&A with that, um, that they did um, quite a few years ago now, and that business has been growing very rapidly. Um, and then also where I saw the other areas I also like are where you see global rollouts um, of companies such as, for example, Yamaha Music, which is um, number one musical instrument maker in, um, in, in the world. And that company has just been growing very steadily, but also adopting very good shareholder policies. Um, and I think that creates a, you know, good opportunities and, and growth rates. And then also the other area bucket, which I also see perhaps five, five, five to ten years of growth, is in sort of EV related um, components where the Japanese are often very strong in um, technologically and so they, 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 those companies will grow quite a bit faster than the overall auto market as EV penetration increases. So again I'm looking for generally long-term compounding companies that I think um, will add value and have some sort of reasonably good shareholder policy. Just to give you a, a sort of snippet of the some of the names uh, you can see on page on page 20 on the next page uh, on, on the slide um, this just shows the, um, the style distribution of the trust and then also um, some of the top sort of positions in the trust. Uh, so I'll give you sort of just a, sort of, obviously you can see very much the trust generally finds that I, we generally, I generally find obviously the opportunities generally being growth. Um, and I find also that generally small cap growth is an area where you, you get better valuations and also you know, longer runways of growth. So I do tend to be overweight there, but I'm quite flexible. So sometimes I will also move more into larger growth if I see more opportunities there. Um, to sort of give you sort of bullet points on just a few of the names in there, just so you can sort of get an idea for some of the names. They're not that well known, some of these um, names, but for example, NOF is a diversified chemicals company, but also deals with um, drug delivery systems and also has the technology, uses the technology for mRNA vaccines. Um, so that's been obviously growing for them, but also they also do cosmetics raw materials where they have very strong um, uh, you know, growth prospects. Misumi kind of is the Amazon of factories. Yoen Keikaku is, uh, actually runs the Muji brand, which you may be familiar with in the UK. Uh, that's growing very rapidly. Um, and then Oriental Land is a name, uh, it, it operates Tokyo Disneyland. So that's kind of a more of a reopening name um, in the fund as we start to perhaps start slowly exit COVID, then some of those names such as Oriental Land, which, have, which runs top, top, basically the top attraction in Tokyo, which is the Disneyland, uh, will start to do well. So that's kind of gives you perhaps a little bit of a flavor of the, of the top positions um, in the trust. And just turning to the next page, uh, this just shows. I mean, one of the this shows some of the sort of perhaps new companies that I, that I mentioned, quite entrepreneurial companies um, uh, that, are, that are that are recently IPO'd and which we which perhaps tend to be less well covered, um, but which I think also presents with quite strong opportunities. So obviously, Coconola is a name we owned and IPO'd um, and um, has done quite well. Um, but also, there's also opportunities as well, especially in some of the, the, the service and the software um, uh, business areas. So turning to the next page, um, this is just the, uh, the, lo the longer term performance of the trust, which is, in the, which is the, um, uh, the, the share price is the yellow line and the NAV is the blue. Um, and then the orange is the index. So you can see that over time, the trust has um, steadily outperformed um, the, in the index in, in quite different market environments. Um, again, I think that's partially a function of basic individual stock selection and also having different sources of idios idiosyncratic alpha, such as unlisted as well. So just to summarize, in 2020, the trust maintained its double digit outperformance, uh, beating, I think, most of the peers and also the index by around about 15 percent. And then year to date in 2021, obviously, we had a very strong uh, value rotation um, in uh, the first half of the year. But the fund, the trust managed to just about outperform um, the index, um, mainly due to um, some sort of, as I mentioned, Coconola's uh, listing and also unreasonable stock picking um, in some of the reopening names. Um, so the trust overall, I think, has had quite solid um, uh, six years or so now of, 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 of performance. Now, just turning to the sort of the final, the final slide. Um, 
or I would just sort of make a quick conclusion. I think the overall, as I mentioned at the beginning, the, the Japanese equity market is often overlooked um, and it's kind of unjustly viewed in terms of performance compared with some other other markets. Where whereas pretty much with the exception of the U.S. As we, show, as we show, showed on the graph there, Japan has performed pretty well. And I think the drivers behind that have been you know, corporate profits bot bottomed out, and the, com the, the, com the, the, the companies have often been exposed to you know, Asian growth, and so they've been on the doorsteps of China and Asia as well, so have been able to take quite a lot of opportunity there. And additionally, also, corporate governance has improved. So we just started to see companies starting to manage their, their balance sheets better um, and focus more on ROIC. And other factors. So that's, I think, really helped, um, uh, you know, some of the individual um, performance of the equities. And then also, again, as, as I showed, Japan's, Japan's companies have got a lot of cash, so they're starting over time to um, de deploy that cash or, um, or return it to shareholders. I think that's also been quite positive. And then on the macro level, as I mentioned in the, during the presentation, there's very limited street coverage, which creates opportunities for us, big on the ground here, researching especially some of the mid and small caps. Um, well, hopefully we can find multi-baggers um, that help the trust as shareholders. And then again, being on the ground here, seeing hundreds of new companies a year um, really adds, I think, a lot of value um, as we can sort of you know, look at new trends that are emerging and understand them um, a little bit faster than um, most people. And so in sort of the areas I look at going forward, um, I think it's, we're, we're, that's also part, it's also part of, I think, of the political agenda as well, is that Japan has been very slow in um, digital efficiency or getting companies to improve their their back offices and their productivity and so we're starting to see i'm investing in quite a bit in new companies that are kind of efficiency enablers they're helping with the digitalization and simplifying processes and i think that trend will continue you know regardless of you know who, who's, who's prime minister or not and the other area that i also think is pretty interesting and it's an area i've been looking at really since 2010s really which is clean energy and, and environmental efficiency. Um, that's been an area where I've, 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 we've, we've, we've identified where Japan has some really very competitive companies um, that can supply those solutions globally. Um, so that, that those are also areas where um, the trust has you know, significant sort of mid-term, you know, long-term positions um, where, where we can see some you know compounding um, growth prospects over those five, five, ten years as the world tries to you know, become more efficient in this use of energy. And then, as I mentioned, the, fund, the trust very much focuses on, you know, has high conviction ideas, and also I capitalize on those pre-IP opportunities, which I think provide differentiated alpha. So um, with that, um, I, I'm, I'm happy to uh, turn it over to uh, questions. Shortly, thank you. Um, but Nicholas, yeah, just thinking about the performance um, that you were touching on there, the, the investment trust performance, um, the rally in uh, large value stocks earlier this year doesn't seem to have hurt uh, the performance uh, too much, even though that's an area you're underweight in. But what does that say about um, your growth at a reasonable price approach? Yes, you're, yes, you're right. So in, in terms of the, it was a very strong star reversal um, this year, I think value outperformed growth through to the middle of June in Japan by almost uh, twenty percent. So um, I think, yeah, it, the, it was a, it was a relatively tough environment in that sense for growth. Um, I think the uh, what helped the trust was, um, I guess, two main, two probably two or three factors. One was that we had the successful IPO of Coconola, um, which. Um, Came in, or came into the UK was was reevaluated as it IPO'd and then went up after the IPO. So that's that that was I think like a three bagger in the period. So I guess I guess that's individual stock picking, um, and then also some of the areas that we just sort of mentioned very much individual stock names such as Mitsu High Tech um, and Azi, which is a pharmaceutical company which also has a you know a very important to Alzheimer's drug. Those stocks also did well. So they kind of they pushed up against the trend and. Um, uh, so help the uh, trust's overall performance, despite the sort of headwinds, as it were, in that period of time. 
Okay. And are, are you quite an active trader of your holdings? I, I ask because the uh, annual report shows that portfolio turnover in the past two years has been 67%, 69% thereabouts. Um, that, that sounds quite, quite active. Yeah. I mean, um, it's more so on the sell discipline side. So um, I'm not really an active trader of holdings in general. It's generally, uh, I, have this, I have some you know, high conviction names that I've owned for three to five years. However, I do kind of follow up um, a relatively disciplined sell uh, discipline approach. So where, like, when the stocks outperform and, and start to approach or get even sort of get halfway to sort of target prices, I'll often be you know, actively trimming those names. Um, and that generally locks in a bit of performance, uh, locks in the performance, um, but also leaves a little bit higher turnover as I'm naturally sort of trimming those names and then trying to get new, and bringing new names into the portfolio from the new ideas um, in, in a, perhaps coming up, coming up the portfolio and challenging those, the, the, the top positions. Um, and so that leads to a little bit more higher turnover. But I think overall, when we, we analyze, the, generally speaking, that the strategy of, of taking profits um, has generally you know, helped the trust performance um, over the midterm. Okay, well, uh, taking profits does sound like a, a good idea. Um, thinking about risk management, your approach to uh, risk in the portfolio, as you've pointed out, the trust is quite highly geared at about 25%, but diversified with 99 holdings, um, but nearly half of those are in the top 10. So, yeah, just your comments on how you uh, uh, manage that sort of risk. Sure. So, as I mentioned last year, we, 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 were, we had lower levels of leverage, um, and then we came obviously into the uh, uh, the Corona crisis, and the markets tanked. And that was then that was then an opportunity I felt to increase the the, the leverage, um, as you know there was a lot of bargains uh, available at that point. Um, so that the, the weighting came up. Um, but generally speaking, my, my approach on on the leverage is to is really on an individual stock basis, and then ask myself if those stocks start to approach my sort of general target price zones. Um, then I would then naturally just be trimming uh, those positions. Um, so that's, I, I wouldn't expect the leverage to sort of go up from here. I would expect it more over the midterm to perhaps go down as I do more profit taking. Um, in terms of the, the sort of 90, yeah, the number of holdings, as, you, as you're right, this is, it's a very high conviction um, trust and, uh, in terms of its concentration of the top 10 holdings. But as I mentioned just previously, I do like to have sort of new challenging, new names coming up in the portfolio to challenge the yeah, hopefully, as the, the winners go up and start approaching target prices, I want to have new names coming in so they can sort of take the place of the of the uh, of the of the past leaders, and um, I can move them sort of move 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 them in and out. So that tends to be why I have a lot of um, uh, you know a few more names uh, and uh, in the in the sort of perhaps you know about fifty to hundred basis point um, uh, you know holdings ratios. Okay, and uh, that gearing, that borrowing you're talking about, you're sl slightly unusual at uh, Fidelity. Um, the, the investment trusts use uh, a type of derivative, uh, CFD, contracts for difference. So you're not borrowing uh, money, you, you're using these derivatives to uh, get exposure to, uh, extra exposure to individual stocks. Is that right? That's, that's correct, yes, yeah. It works, works pretty well. It's easy for us to conceptually understand, yeah. Okay. And, and I think it's a bit uh, cheaper as well. Um, just turning to your uh, private equity positions, um, you've mentioned you've, got, uh, you've started investing in private companies before they come to the stock market. I think you've got three uh, unlisted companies at present, and I think just over 3%, is that right, of the trust in them? Um, is that correct? We're approximately that level, I think, yeah. I think so, yes, approximately, yeah. You've, you've done really well so far, so I'm just kind of obvious question, really. You know, you've, you've got a, you can go up to 10% in, in private equity, uh, but you're at 3%. So given your success with uh, the la likes of Raxul and Coconola, you know, why not do more? What's holding you back? Yeah, so, yeah, so we, we, we did. It, it, it's, um, uh, it's, uh, we, we're fairly disciplined on what we want to invest in. Um, and I'm looking generally to, for if I can find this, with two or three baggers uh, from uh, the pre-IPOs. So it, uh, we see a lot. Of, we see quite a lot of companies, uh, but we're pretty selective um, in what we're trying to invest in. But I do think that over the midterm, we will probably be approaching that 10% level. Um, as I said, as I, as I mentioned, I think we do see, you know, more opportunities um, all the time um, in that part of the market. But again, quite focused on valuation discipline. Okay, yes, and, uh, and the investment trust structure is, is a good one in which to hold uh, 
uh, unquoted companies or a certain amount of them. Um, yeah, last question. Um, returning to, to politics, we've talked about this a bit already, but you know, just, just why has um, Yoshihide Suga's resignation boosted investor sentiment quite so strongly in the past week? And, and what, if anything, are you looking for, for from the new Prime Minister? <coughs> Yeah, so I, I think the, the, the reason why um, the market reacted positively was the, um, as, as you know, the, the, we have to have an election, general election here before the end of the year. Um, so the, so the, the market, I, I would presume, was, was relatively um, uh, concerned that the LDP might do quite badly um, in the coming election uh, with Suga at, as the prime minister. And so I think the, the hope in the market is that the new prime minister, whoever that person is, uh, will have at least a temporary boost in the polls so the LDP gets re-elected, which is what the market, I guess, presumes is, is, a, is a positive factor. Um, and so obviously we don't know who the next prime minister will be. Um, if you read the papers, um, it appears, you know, Kono is probably the most, um, uh, the favourite currently, but we, we never know. In, uh, in, in Japanese politics, especially LDP politics. Um, I, Kono would, would, would potentially be quite interesting, I think, in the sense he seems to be a bit of a reformer. Um, and uh, also, um, I think he speaks, if I remember right, speaks very fluent English um, and has sort of, sort of deregulation ideas. So that might be something that if perhaps if he, if he was elected, um, that might be Terms, you know, it's a positive for the market. But as I said, I think we're sort of very early days and to, to know who's going to be the next prime minister um, in, in Japan. Okay, so yeah, the market's looking forward to, to more uh, market friendly uh, reforms uh, in the style of uh, Arbenomics um, under the uh, next leader of the uh, Liberal Democratic Party. Okay, well, um, it, it, it's time, nearly time, uh, to the questions from the, from the audience, Jeremy. Um, but we've got one more uh, poll question to, to ask you all, um, if we can get that lined up. Um, the question is, last question we'd like to ask you is, yeah, having heard what you've heard so far, are you more likely to invest in Japan after what you've heard today? Are you more likely to invest in Japan? Uh, yes or no? And, um, yeah, we'll just wait for those uh, results to come in again, Nicholas. But uh, you're, 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 there's, there's been lots of negativity around Japan over a, a large part of your career, I suspect. But um, the, the, the dust seems to be blowing away in the past 10 years. The, there's a long, long recession. People worry about the country's demographics, ageing population, big debts and everything. But um, you're telling us about the more exciting dimension. Uh, uh, that message seems to be getting through, judging from what's happening to, to markets. Yeah. yeah, I think so, yes. I think uh, it's kind of been a long, um, sort of slow process, but uh, as, you, as you mentioned, it's kind of come out a little bit out of deflation into a slightly better economic environment. And then again, also companies have been restructured and also adopted better corporate governance. Um, and those factors, along with sort of, you know, good earnings growth, have sort of helped the market, I think. Um, and I think those general trends are kind of fairly well set. Um, and so I'm, I'm reasonably positive on the market, sort of, you know, midterm if you look out the next, you know, three to five years. Okay. Well, the good news is uh, three quarters of our audience um, are thinking of investing more in Japan. So uh, obviously hoping that, uh, that the market will catch up with the other global markets. So that's very good. But Jeremy, it's now time to turn over to you. Actually, Jeremy, it's worth mentioning that you've actually uh, lived in Japan for a couple of years in Nagasaki, wasn't that right? That's right. Uh, that's right, Gavin. I lived in Nagasaki in, in southwest Japan for a couple of years. So n not quite as long as Nicholas. And uh, yeah, I think probably his Japanese is also rather better than mine. So We won't test you. Not just yet anyway. But I see there's a bit a few questions coming through mm. on the Olympics, on uh, the funds turnover. Um, I think we've uh, dealt with that. Active share, China, uh, economic policy. Yeah, w w uh, really, where do you want to start? That's right, Gavin. Lots of interesting questions. Um, so yeah, hi, hi Nicholas. Why, why don't we start on the Olympics? Um, Dominic Moynihan asks, have the Olympics and Paralympics, which have now finished, of course, been hanging over Japan um, with no spectators and so on? Has there been any impact on the Japanese economy? Yeah, so I think obviously there was there was a, an impact on the Japanese economy in the in the, the build-up to that, obviously building and construction, all those different factors. But the fact because um, pretty much you couldn't you couldn't go out 
uh, to, to, to restaurants. Well, you could go out to restaurants, but you couldn't go out to bars and all that type of thing. I think, generally speaking, the, um, the, so the, the, the result of the Olympics in terms of economic stimulus was fairly limited in the last few months. So in a way, yes, I think people sort of are, um, at post-Olympics, we're starting to see, um, you know, currently uh, sort of, you know, vaccination rates have sort of finally sort of start to approach levels of the UK and the US, and we're starting to see the early signs potentially of, um, you know, at least a peak out in the number of, you know, COVID cases, et cetera. Um, so um, hopefully that's sort of, you know, that trend will continue. OK, well, that, yeah, that, that sounds like good news, of course. Um, a question about an increasingly assertive China. Uh, David Lucy asks, what is the possible impact on Japanese markets from its aggressive neighbour? Well, Japan, I think, has to you know, maintain a diff difficult balance there between its, you know, its defence sort of comes from the United States alliance. At the same time, the bulk of its trade comes from, from China. So it has to walk always a di di you know, difficult tightrope there. Um, I don't think that will that will change, um, and um, you know I think that over time, the uh, well, I think we've we 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 have we've had we had a we we have, we, have, we do have, you do have sort of waves of of sort of of time was where for example uh, back in 2011 12 there was some sort of quite some negative sentiment against Japan from China then it moved quite positively. Um, so I think it's be down to perhaps to a certain extent very much this you know, the new prime minister's um, you know approaches to China will probably determine the um, uh, you know the, the the relationship there. Okay, thanks. And just something I sometimes wonder about myself. Um, you mentioned Japanese trade with China. You know, is Japan a bit of a sort of backdoor way to get exposure to Chinese growth, particularly with say you know Chinese middle class traveling more and that kind of stuff. Yes, it has been. I mean, especially on the consumer well, on the consumer side, um, cosmetics um, uh, uh, and also sort of uh, travel and those type of areas. Yeah, they've all benefited very much from uh, Chinese tourists coming to Japan. Um, I think they were the number one category um, before COVID. And I would expect that um, once we sort of get over the travel restrictions at some point, um, that they will also be the game, the number one visitors to Japan. And be big spenders in Japan on on you know on um, on hotels and entertainment and and shopping. So uh, that's an area perhaps you know uh, perhaps it may be a year or, year or so down the line. But I think that's also an opportunity. Interesting. Th th thanks, Nicholas. Um, so uh, a question from a Aaron Sybil here. Um, we, we, we've seen how you have these quite big high conviction holdings in some mid caps. But he asks, what's the active share of the portfolio versus the Japanese market? And is that a differentiating point compared to rivals? Perhaps roughly speaking, you know, we, we, we may not need the exact number. Yes, I don't have the active because we're using leverage. The, yeah, the, act, the active ratio becomes above 100 percent. So right. Um, but, but yeah, I you know generally um, it, it it is I think probably a, a differentiating a differentiating factor the fact that we are using um, uh, I mean a bit probably we're using leverage and also uh, the active the active ratio is probably even if you exclude exclude um, even if you exclude leverage we're about ninety percent active weight so I think that's fairly uh, um, uh, differentiated compared with some of our um, peer group. Yeah. OK. And uh, uh, well, a, ma a macro question here. Uh, Stephen Hill asks, you know, how is Japan's economic policy evolving? And well, what, what does that mean for the trust? Well, I think the the major trend, I mean, I, I don't see sort of, sort of major tra changes in Japanese economic policy, um, you know, in the short term. Um, the opportunities are, I think, more in, as I mentioned, the government has set up a digital agency, a digital agency uh, from from September this year. Um, and they seem fairly serious about trying to improve the efficiencies in the economy because we have a shrinking labor force and you have to improve the productivity in the service sector and also in the manufacturing sector. And also you have to use less energy to, to make things and, tra and travel and things. So, so there's a lot of opportunity for, for, for those efficiency enablers, um, some of those names in software or in manufacturing, fa fa you know, um, factory, factory automation equipment, or can be air conditioning, whatever is basically, whatever is helping um, the country become more efficient. I think those companies, will, they're, help, they're helping the country, helping consumers or companies become more efficient. Those companies will also benefit and grow. So those are really key areas for the trust 
um, in terms of the, the core holdings. Yeah, and is that an area in terms of those efficiency enablers you mentioned, factor automation? As you said, there, there, there are some big holdings in the portfolio, but is that somewhere you've been adding to more? Yeah, yeah, I think that um, I, I've sort of moved, uh, moved uh, last year I had um, quite a lot of cyclical tech, um, which did quite well, um, but when I sort of took profits in that last year, I moved a bit more into what I call those sort of long-term sustainable um, growth names um, in the some of those efficiency enablers or, you know, clean energy or energy efficiency, because I think those are kind of multi-year stories that will kind of continue to work, um, you know, uh, going forward. Yeah. Okay. Th th thanks, Nicholas. A kind of interesting question uh, from, from Rowan here, which is kind of related to these topics. He says, I think I'm right in saying that the aggregate uh, R&D spend of Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, and Google exceeds the whole of corporate Japan. I haven't checked that, but it, sounds, it does sound possible. Are you worried that the broader Japanese market is destined to remain in the shadows of US mega tech stocks over time? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, we, we are starting to see some sort of consolidation in different parts of the economy. So that can help, um, uh, you know, so in, so some, in so some of the internet areas where obviously U.S. companies have dominated. There may be some moves back in some parts of the parts of the, you know, the internet area. Um, but, yeah, I, th I think it's, it's a, the, 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 the fact is that Japan is not, um, it doesn't it doesn't have those it doesn't have apple anymore it used to have you know sony but sony had to transform itself um to come something something different so i think japan will do quite well as in a way the workshop of the world um it has you know very good it has a very sort of r d intensive companies um in certain just certain parts of the market so it might be in chemicals specialty chemicals um it might be an EV, you know, in electrical vehicle materials. So there are, the, 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 especially the materials technology, Japan is still very strong. And that advantage will probably not be eroded for a few, quite a few years. Um, so I think um, that's, uh, you know, one point. And then I, with, within also my, the sort of my, my, my investment style and the trust also, I will tend to own companies that I think, uh, you know, are committing enough R&D uh, to become world leaders. So, for example, I own Olympus, which is... Um, you know, number one make, maker of, you know, endoscopes in the world. And that business grows very steadily, you know, very good new product development and also high R&D as well. So those type of companies, I think, uh, you know, you do need to definitely focus on R&D as a source of competitiveness. Yeah. OK, so Japan still still maintaining its edge in, in some niches. That, thanks. Um, quest, interesting question from Anna Dingley here about uh, ESG, so environmental, social and, and, and corporate governance. Wh which companies in Japan do you think are riding the ESG wave most effectively? Um, well, I think there's a lot of change um, is occurring, um, and certainly we have a ESG team, dedicated team in Tokyo, uh, who engage with the companies that we own um, to, you know, improve their ESG and corporate governance. And we, I, I've seen, you know, I've been very surprised, pleasantly surprised over the last 12 months or so, how receptive companies are to sort of, the, you know, our suggestions and what we think they can improve things um, on. I think I, if I was looking at sort of the lead, in, in the portfolio, I was going to say probably one company that's done very well um, has been a leader. It's probably be, would, be, would be Yamaha Music. Um, they've just done a, they've done a great job on the board, gov governance, um, shelter returns, and also all the other different um, factors that go into ESG. So I think uh, that, I would say that's been a leader. I think it's quite well recognised as well. I think it's highly rated um, by um, uh, the uh, you know uh, MSCI as well. Mm. Okay. Actually, and, uh, yeah, Jeremy, and Nicholas, it was, uh, it was interesting reading your recent, uh, the trust recent half year results. Um, it, it might be worth p picking up on um, the factory automation supplier, Masumi. I think it's your, your second biggest holding. But, um, you know, com uh, you flagged up the fact that companies like that can be doing good things, but they're not necessarily telling the world about it. So, uh, you're push you're, I understand you're pushing companies to, be, to improve their disclosure so that ESG investors actually know that they are uh, doing good things. Yes, I mean, so so some companies will, they may have internally all these, most of these policies in place, but they're just not putting them on the website. Um, or I'm, putting, I'm not putting them in English on the website. So um, some of that's very simple. Um, uh, but other, other other factors, obviously, you have, you have to do more, more work with them on. But that's some of the sort of, I, I guess you would call it, you know, low-hanging low fruit, as it were, in terms of 
you know, improving um, disclosures. Yeah. And what about on the environment, uh, the E side of the things, the clean energy? Uh, how, um, how are you uh, exploring that, exploiting that theme within the portfolio? Yeah. Um, so the, um, some of the sort of, I mean, for example, I own, um, I, I also sort of, on a kind of simple basis, I own sort of obviously Diking, which is, you know, global manufacturer of air conditioning units, which basically produces, you know, more efficient um, using technology to reduce, you know, the, the, um, the, the electricity consumed by those units. Um, I also own um, a RINAI, which is a you know, global maker of, of gas um, or water heaters. Um, again, their efficiency um, uh, through generations um, and uh, uh, it creates creates of much less um, you know, CO2 emissions. Um, but it's so kind of right across the board. There's lots of companies doing um, uh, different activities that can um, uh, you know reduce emissions. And a lot of the companies have starting to have targets as well. So, you know, starting to hit, you know, carbon neutral by 2030, those type of targets are emerging for a lot of companies as well. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Jeremy, you got any more, any more new questions come in? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just sort of picking up on what we were saying on engagement, something I wanted to ask you about was uh, activism in Japan. Uh, we're seeing a lot more activism in Japan and, you know, private equity interest as well, particularly in smaller and medium-sized companies. You know, what, what do you think of that trend? And, uh, you know, are people in Japan uh, unhappy about it or, 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 you know, are companies becoming more receptive? Yeah, I think it kind of, it sort of blends with the, um, the corporate governance reforms um, and sort of the, the, the government sort of, and the effort, the government... Uh, Sort of introducing sort of, sort of better codes of conduct for companies in how they, you know, manage shareholders and have you know, and boards, etc., like that. So I think um, that uh, the uh, activists, to a certain extent, are sort of um, part of that. Part of that sort of, you know, they, they, they're um, they've been able to sort of work with the changes that have happened by the other from the Japanese government level uh, for corporate governance. Um, and so I think that I think that I think that trend will most likely continue um, for you know for the current uh, you know political as long as the political environment doesn't change um, I, I see that probably trend uh, continuing. Okay, thank you. And uh, so, something about the the change of prime minister that I don't think we've quite yet, yet teased out. Some people have been saying this is going to usher in more more stimulus, um, which, which would be you know positive for for the domestic economy and domestically exposed stocks. Um, uh, you know, what, what what do you think about that? I mean, certainly the the Japan central bank uh, has had ultra loose monetary policy for a long time now. Yeah. So I don't think the I don't think the monetary side will be even more stimulated no so um i think there may be some 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 i, I don't think there'll be some massive stimulus that like as we saw in the united states as we're sort of you know, hopefully we're coming out of the um uh uh the worst stages of covid um i think there may be some you know individual incentive programs for companies to digitalize their processes there may be um you know government grants for that possibly um also there may be, um, you know, we had, uh, actually last year we had it, it wasn't that successful because it was in the middle of COVID, but we had a go to travel campaign. Um, uh, but again, that also may well be introduced if, if, if the uh, you know, vaccination rates go up and infections go down, then that type of stimulus might be used. So you get, you know, perhaps an extra, you get a, whatever, 10% off your restaurant meal or 20% off your hotel bill um, if, you, if you go traveling. That type of thing may happen, perhaps probably more in the new year. I would have thought, but uh, that, that, that type of stimulus, but probably fairly targeted, uh, not to general stimulus. Okay. Um, interesting question about here about, you know, what, what drives share price movements in the Japanese market? Uh, you know, we're, question referencing Gaijin investors. Gaijin means foreigner in, in Japanese. Where does the demand for Japanese shares come from? Is it from Japanese institutions or is it from foreign investors? Who, you know, what really sets the price? Yeah. I mean, uh, long term, you know, stock prices are formulated by earnings. Um, so it's generally you know, earnings are the, are the long term drivers. So you own the companies with the best long term growth prospects. Um, you, you know, they'll do they'll do better than the others. Yeah. Um, the I think in terms of the guy, the sort of foreigner participation in the market tends to be quite high. Um, and 
especially on sort of trade the trade trading side. So the Japanese investors certainly look at look at them quite carefully. Um, but I think probably the sources of demand for Japanese equity probably will change a bit over time. So you'll probably see over time a bit more individuals um, and also a bit more from uh, corporates as well, because you're starting to see a lot more buybacks. So you see quite quite chunky buybacks, um, the five five percent plus um, buyers, um, you know, uh, off, by, by by companies as well. So that will also be a source of demand, I think, for Japanese equities going forward. But yeah, I think foreign investors are generally about thirty percent of the market, but on a daily basis for trading, they're about sixty percent or so. Yeah. So they are they they are quite a big, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, daily impact. Yeah. Actually, Jeremy, I've got a question here. Just uh, Jack Nicholas, you mentioned the, the buybacks, the amount of buybacks and the return of so capital to, to shareholders. Uh, it makes me think about uh, dividends. And you said that the, the dividends have been pretty resilient uh, in Japan during the uh, coronavirus and, uh, and, and, and they're, they're, they're steadily rising um, over time. But um, yeah, could you just tell us about the uh, investment trust's uh, dividend policy? Uh, you're not currently paying a dividend, uh, I understand. That's correct. I mean, I, we think generally there's more opportunities sort of in the, you know, with, you, you've been reinvesting that into the into finding great names and investing the capital there. Um, but in terms of shareholder policy, you know, the board does have a, um, you know, buyback program in place. Um, as you mentioned, you know, the, the discount, uh, despite some pretty good performance, is still there. And so the, um, the board has from time to time, you know, conducted buybacks on a regular basis. So I think that's where the board sees the, um, uh, the sort of correct strategy. Yep, yep. So, so yeah, a good, uh, a good stock for, for, for growth investors, and uh, and the shares are trading about a six percent discount at the moment. I think. Um, I, I've got another question, a uh, completely different topic, but actually wonder if you could uh, help me out. So, something that puzzles me. You know, this year we've seen uh, the prospect of rising inflation hit uh, technology and growth stocks around the world. I'm just wondering how does that apply to Japan? Because in Japan, inflation is very low, is it not? So does that mean the tech companies that are more insulated from that kind of fear? Or how does that play out? Well, I think on a day-to-day -day basis, um, we we do get we with the you know, the U.S. market trend tends to impact uh, the Japanese market. So, if you, as you mentioned, if there's a growth sell from the United States even, you know, because of rising interest rate fears, it does tend to impact growth stocks in Japan as well. Um, I think probably the difference is that um, because there's very little prospects for Japanese interest rates to rise in the short term. Generally speaking, our financials in Japan don't do that well. Um, when uh, you know they, they go, they they move up a bit, but because Japan, it's very unlikely the Japanese interest rates rise in the short term, they generally come back down again. So that's generally the, sort of the, the kind of the flow. So on a daily basis, I mentioned it tends to be they will tend to follow U.S. trends, um, you know, in, in the short term. But generally speaking, valuations here are a bit cheaper as well compared with um, you know U.S. stocks. So they kind of they, they follow it, but more, more with a muted, um, muted result. Brilliant. Well, thanks for clarifying that. Um, we've got time for one more question, and I think it's going to come from Jeremy. And uh, you want to ask about the yen, I think. That's right. So I think the, the, the yen has been weakening, uh, which might, in the short term, hit returns for, for foreign investors. But, you know, what, what does that mean for the companies in the portfolio? As we said, Japan does have a lot of exporters. Yeah, so, you know, obviously a slightly weaker yen, uh, will tend to um, help those earnings in, in yen. Um, but generally speaking, the portfolio is fairly neutral um, in the sense of, you know, it's, it's exposure to exporters um, relative to the market. Um, so in terms of relative performance for the market, it probably won't impact uh, that much. But it may it will probably increase the, um, you know, the earnings of some of those sort of, you know, exporters um, in, the, in the portfolio. OK, so perhaps another tailwind for Japanese stocks there as, uh, you know, the vaccine rollout also continues. OK, brilliant. Well, listen, I think that, I'm afraid, is nearly all we've got time for. So uh, thank you very much, Jeremy, for uh, uh, monitoring the questions and putting them to, to Nicholas just now. Nicholas, thanks very much for your time. And, and to our audience also, thank you very much for uh, uh, spending our time with us and uh, answering our questions. Um, one more request, if you could please fill in uh, that feedback form before you log off. And um, please look out for more uh, Investment Trust events uh, at CityWire. Uh, we've got a, quite a few more lined up this year. Um, but in the meantime, um, that's it from us. Thank you very much for being with us. And um, all the best with your investing. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.